to have uh, Danish flags on the on 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 the slide, so I put in a, a little Swedish flag as well. Um, okay, um, I I have been asked to talk about the problem with guidelines when you're at bedside. We have heard a lot of bedside discussions here. Uh, uh, no, sorry, a lot of guideline discussions here. And uh, yes, first, I have none, no disclosures. Uh, so, so the pa is it really the patient and the guidelines, or the guidelines and the patient? Um, I've, I drove this road some months ago, south of San Francisco. Should we follow the guidelines so the evidence-based medicine? Is this the only way to go Cochrane? I don't know. Um, the guidelines, are they support or are they stone tablets? Perhaps that's a matter of philosophy, I don't know. But um, um, I will ha give you some examples where I think it's quite difficult to use the guidelines. Perhaps not for all of you, but for me. The first patient, this is patient, th th these are really patients that I have met, that, I'm, and, uh, that I meet several times a year. So, this is a, a woman with breast cancer. She's planned for chemotherapy. The guidelines, the Swedish oncology guidelines promote PIC. But uh, she has a friend who has had a PIC for the same indication, and she got the thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So she refused to have that PIC. Should I follow the guidelines? I think some will do. I would not have done it. Uh, but I will go out outside the Swedish guidelines if I do it. I mostly work with, although I am an anesthesiologist, I'm mostly working in the ICU. This woman, in the middle of the night, cerebral palsy with severe contractions, contractions in all joints. I suppose you have seen that kind of patients, they look like this. Uh, she's on mechanical ventilation for severe pneumonia. She's in septic shock. She definitely needs a central venous line. Her contracting is like that. She has an internal juggler. There is a thrombosis in that due to a previous catheter. So, I had to insert a new catheter. What do the guidelines say about this situation? I can't visualize anything. Uh, and unfortunately, the guidelines do not include call Dr. Pitarutti in the middle of the night. That is not possible. So, how do I solve this situation? A cut down somewhere. I did a blind subclavian. This patient is a part of my reality as well. Uh, a severe car accident. He has been entrapped for 40 minutes. Both legs are shattered. I have bilateral femoral tourniquets and a cervical collar. He arrives at the ED, he's unconscious, he has bilateral IOs. The surgeons immediately start to do tracosynthesis, and there's a lot of blood coming out. He has no blood pressure, we must need, we need more blood. What should I do? How about the guidelines concerning hygiene? Which vessels to use? And should I use ultrasound in this extreme acute situation. You can do this situation even more acute. There are publications now from uh, the American hospitals in Afghanistan when they insert uh, 
think they, they use peer catheter introducers when these type of patients arrive at the hospital and they do blind subclavian insertion. And that's not part of our guidelines. This patient I had to deal with last summer. He has an acute leukemia, he has allergenic stem cell transplantation, he has a sev severe graft versus host reaction in the skin. The Swedish law, I would say, <laughs> is to clean the insertion site with alcohol and chlorhexidine. But it's so painful for him, so have, you have to give him general anesthesia to perform this. It's not possible to buy chlorhexidine 2% in Sweden. I asked the company to produce it, but they won't. What do the guidelines say in this situation? Should I put, should I put him in general anesthesia every time? Or is there any alternatives? So, I think a lot of you have very different solutions to these problems. Perhaps some of you would say uh, you can use the guidelines, some would not. And that is, of course, also differs because of your skills and experiences. But in my opinion, guidelines are at the best the product of high quality evidence. But as we have discussed during the last days, we not unfortunately, we do not have high quality evidence so often. But we also know that good adherence to well established guidelines are really necessary. That is proven several times from different countries, even in Sweden. And in my opinion, guidelines are support for rotis and decision making. They are not stone tablets. We can go very wrong if you use them in that way. And the problem is that we have that we have discussed for the last days, they are very seldom included the patient's opinion. I'm just now uh, putting the last pieces on the new Swedish recommendations for all CVC insertion and care education. And we have not a single word about ask the patient. I have to change that in the last hour, I think. Thank you very much. Somebody from the audience who would like to address a question to Dr. Hamos Schultz. I would like to ask you something, if you can, doctor. Hmm? What happens when it comes to the legal issue? I mean, okay, you well know that the guidelines are not uh, stone tablets, as you mentioned before. Okay. But uh, if somebody pressed charges on you that because you didn't follow the guidelines, I mean, in your case, as uh, you well described us, for example, the woman doesn't want to have a pre-client implanted for an adjuvant therapy, and uh, so you may have to implant a chest port, for example. And uh, during the chest port insertion, uh, you have a very severe trauma the carotid artery, which is atheromatosis, and there is a very big uh, hemorrhage and a matoma, and uh, maybe the patient uh, faces some uh, very severe problems, etc., etc., etc. If uh, somebody press charges on you, uh, the judge and the court, what will do in your country? Will he tell you that, okay, you had to follow some guidelines, but you, you could be flexible, or he will charge you for not be restricted at the guidelines? That, that, it might sound very strange to you all, but that won't happen in Sweden. Okay. We, what exactly? We, we don't, our legal system does not work in that way. Mm -hmm. So, I... I will be, uh, uh, they, w they could put charges to me to, to the, um, uh, uh, the state.
mm-hmm. that have done wrong to give me a mark, but it will not be a, a lawyer thing or anything. That that oh. you have to be something like a murder or some a homicide okay. situation. That won't happen in Sweden. We don't have that system. You can mm-hmm. argue you if that's good or wrong, but I don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, I suppose in UK and in US you have a lot of lawyers. Uh, doing their living for this. I don't think, I don't know if that's better, if you have less complications, I don't know. But that's not the Swedish system. Okay. Thank you very much, I do understand. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? I'm oh, sorry, Hi. Jack, sorry. Jack Ledun from Baltimore. Um, you know, you told us two examples where you're stuck in blind subclavians. You know, I think at this conference it's been pretty clear that we want you to put an ultrasound on the patient and stick it in the axillary vein. You know, that you should, you know, probably, I, I imagine the reason you did a blind is you don't know how to do the ultrasound guided axillary, but that's a, a knowledge gap that should probably be closed. Definitely be, I mean, the people at this conference are clear, it's not maybe. And the patient, say the patient you're describing with the uh, massive bleeding, what I say is that patient can't afford another injury. We have to do that as safely as possible like by visualizing the vein and following the needle down into the vein. I think if you ask the, uh, the UK physicians on the gr- uh, working in London streets, do, go, going uh, to um, across the streets in, in this kind of situation, they use the blind subclavian. Your, your physicians in Afghanistan use the same, but I think, I think in my country we are not there. In this hyper-acute situation, it's a lot of people that very few, very few anesthesiologists would in, right now will have, have the skill to, to use the ultrasound and put in it in the axillary vein. So that's a gap that should be closed. Yes. Yeah. So I have a question. Specific to the guidelines, and we have to admit, there are many now. There are many different organizations that publish recommendations. There are many guidelines. Some that we feel are stronger, some that we feel are less. How do you decide? How do you know which guidelines are going to dictate your practice, as you've described, um, respectfully, of course, uh, how do you know which guidelines? And e- I suggest that because there are so many guidelines and recommendations, that that in and of itself provides you with some level of flexibility. <laughs> yes, that's true. And, and we can see that uh, several guidelines use the same evidence to get to contradictory recommendations. That's true, isn't it? Um, so, in Sweden it's easy. I write the guidelines. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, oh, I'm, all, I'm part of it. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I do not always agree with you, with uh, the guidelines from Italy and US in all situations, but I think on 95% of it, we agree. And, uh, I promote ultrasound in all situations, but I can't say use ultrasound in Sweden. We have no, we, as, you, as I said before, we don't have that legal system, so I can't say you, are, you will be charged if you don't use it. So you have to come across a lot of old traditions in Sweden where physicians do as they always have done. Although we are out of, out of time, uh, please, uh, Mrs. Chris Clayton, yep. you can also have an, a question. Thank you. Question. Um, I just wanted to say they were amazing guidelines. They really make us think outside of the box and makes me very thankful for the nice little paediatric bubble I work in in Brisbane in Australia. Um, but I guess from my perspective, I often think the guidelines are just guidelines. They're there to guide us. And are they there for the vast majority of clinical situations? And a lot of the case studies that you presented would fall outside of usual guidelines. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I think so. Pediatrics is an extremely 
good example of that because the, the pediatric guidelines are, if you should use the evidence-based words, it's a very low level of evidence. We have tried in the new guidelines in Sweden to include pediatric decisions and it's so, so difficult. Yeah. It's, it's experts' opinion everywhere. <laughs> and that is not my cases. expert opinion in that case. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much, doctor. The next speaker is Dr. Peter Carr. He has a clinical background, especially in peripherally inserted vascular catheters. And nowadays, currently, he's a senior lecturer at Griffith University. I'm quite sure that his speech will be unique as always. We'll welcome you, Carl. Good afternoon, everyone. Always figure out how to use the clicker before you come up on stage. Um, my disclosures are with the um, Avatar group. You've heard about that during the week. Um, this is my Twitter handle. I'm going to focus on Cochrane documents, okay? And do they consider the patient? That's what I'm going to focus on. Um, there are two people that I know in the world that ask a rhetorical question. One was the poet William Butler Yeats, and the second one is, I, can't, I honestly can't remember this guy's name, but he's a friend of mine. And it is a rhetorical question because Cochrane do. They've got their Cochrane Colloquium. In Edinburgh, a few weeks' time, the theme is Cochrane for all, better evidence for better health decisions, co-designed, produced, and presented with patients and other healthcare consumers. How about that? How about that? How many patients presented here this week? How many patients? How many PPI, patient and public involvement researchers presented here? in our theme, in a World Congress. And really we have to, be, we have to revise what is evidence-based practice. And time and time again we have to do that. It is the judicious use of the evidence between what the clinical expertise is, Mauro, okay? With the patient values, what device they want with, an, with using the appraisal of the best systematic evidence. Simple as. It's not rocket science. So it could be the clinical expertise that we might always go to the auxiliary and the clinician will realize that. But maybe the patient might want it here or they might want a low IJ approach. It's their choice. They're going to wear the catheter, not us. And then you use the evidence and maybe there might be a new technology such as ultrasound that you use. And bang in the middle, they cross over and you'll have a shared decision with the patient where possible. So if you haven't heard, the Cochrane collaboration is really important. And it was defined by Archie Cochrane that it is a great criticism of medicine and be it nursing and be it healthcare that we've not organized a critical summary of evidence. So here is the evidence that I got involved with. There's three of the authors on this paper in the room, I'm glad to say. Could you imagine if we use this mantra called evidence-based practice and clinical specialists in vascular access and married them together, that we'd have to have a debate about using ultrasound, that we'd have to have a debate about going in blindly, that we'd have to start using sterile approaches, do you honestly think we would turn this into a half an hour conference? We really would. And it's true. We don't have the evidence to prove that we are specialists. We can talk about it. But talk is very, very easy. The Cochrane collaboration very quickly get the evidence out. And they're not on stone tablets now. They're living systematic reviews. They're updated straight away because people want that information straight away when they have to think about it. Cochrane is great. Google it. Cochrane it. They have their own search engine. Put the evidence in there. See what it comes out with. Use it. Google is also the first point of contact. <laughs> 
And people will come to their clinician and say, well, I saw it on the internet, I googled it. But it's true. So there is the exact opposite for the patient. Don't confuse your one-hour lecture with me living with my port for 20 years. Absolutely. That's sheer decision-making. That's putting the patient values right in that equation. And we have this mantra that drives me cracked, the difficult intravenous access. If someone came to hospital and called me difficult, it's probably because I would be obnoxious and really testing them about the science. Not that I'm difficult. Don't be labeling us. Imagine if you had a diagnosis of cancer and then you get, oh, he's difficult access. That would be a pretty shit day, wouldn't it? That's the lived experience. So stop being so difficult. Stop telling me I'm difficult. The Everest of evidence. Potentially spoken about during the week. For me, the top of evidence is systematic reviews and meta-analyses, identifying cause and effect, randomized control trials, which we see in the avatar group. But the bottom base camp is level seven authority, and it's the most pop it's the most popular and persuasive type of evidence. And you got it here all week at the conference. Authority, driving it out. No, 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 it's my opinion because we need to have clinical expertise. Where's the patient deciding that? And where's the systematic review evidence deciding that? It's only one side. It's a bit like um, catheter vessel ratio. We're only focusing on uh, size. We're not focusing on the other um, mechanistic causes. But I'll tell you this, in about five years' time, the patient voice will be, it'll be coming up to the top of Ever Everest. And, re and realist review methodology and reviewing the patient experience and other qualitative de designs. So we won't be focusing on the p-value. We'll be focusing on other p-values. And what patients really want is cl clinically significant, meaningful data and significant data. The guidelines are, sh are, are shoddy. They don't include the patient and they acknowledge that. But these equator guidelines for any trial, any study in science in healthcare that you want to write will make sure that you include the patient in that report. So, I'll leave you with this. Cochrane evidence is brilliant, but you've got to reconstitute it with another drug. And that is ISPI. Implementation science with the patient involved in it. That's why the science doesn't work. Because you have the same ordinary 5-8s in the hospital that have no idea about evidence. They don't care about it. They're the blockers. They don't want the teams coming in because we've got Dr. John to do a good blind insertion and he'll keep doing that. But as soon as we build the patient voice and make them realize that it's unacceptable to have a blind insertion, then we'll start getting right, reconstituted, patient-included evidence with the systematic reviews. The other route is, and the other medicine you're left with, and you, for all the good it'll do you, you might as well. And that's what it is there. And we've heard plenty of it this week. I'll see you in Sydney. It was unique, as I promised you. So, any questions from the audience? Professor Keo. Thanks, Pete, as ever, for a passionate um, lay down misère. <laughs> um, I agree with everything you say, um, but I had it put to me when I was on the, the, the dais uh, earlier in the week. Uh, we know what, but we don't know how. And it is, and, and it is a careful balance. I don't know if, um, if you could expand a little bit more on how we'll get the patient in. And that, that there is a balance between um, knowing the evidence and what's right, so that, for example, the case study um, for the doctor before you, where the patient had that N equals 1 experience of a bad pick and didn't want to have a pick, but clearly then if she doesn't have a pick, her therapeutic. Um, so just, just balancing patient experience, patient needs with uh, the therapy, the evidence. A bit of a how? Yeah, like... Um Linda Kelly, um, who is doing a PhD on the lived experience 
using phenomenology design. Um, and it's, it's that stunning narrative that I think is going to get far more powerful when we make these clinical decisions. And that will create a better, richer, you know, balanced body of evidence that patients can use and also clinicians can use. So when it goes about device choice, it, it considers those factors. And that, that, that's my thinking on it. But I'm not an implementation scientist. I'm not a scientist that researches involving the patient in it. But I certainly include them in any clinical question. So, and, that, yeah. and that's that's that would go for any device design, I so, imagine. So maybe that's the, the next thing. Any trials that any of us do, we make sure we include that um, patient experience, patient acceptability, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Any other questions? Just one yes, question. Sir, There's a lot of people that say they write meta-analyses, uh, but they don't use a systematic approach similar to the, what the Cochrane folks do, but they're out there and touted and quoted. How do, we route, how do we get them out of the system because they're confusing a lot of people? So the, the, it's, that's an excellent question. Um, um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, um, we didn't get an opportunity to do a meta-analysis on the particular uh, Cochrane review that I co-authored. There's, in the same way there's going to be questionable clinical practice, there's going to be questionable clinical research practice. And if you get the data in, you can have a play with it, you can come up with the right algorithm, the right um, data uh, formula, and you can spin out um, an, an answer in a forest plot that would suit your product or your cl clinician clinical question. Um, I, I would suggest all trials, the all trials campaign, where a clinical trial, there's a protocol publication, the trials are registered in a, in, in a, a trial registry, it, it assists with replication science, and then that will get to the top of Everest, and you'll, you'll find very quickly that the, the bad meta-analyses will be found out, and there, there are researchers out there that do research on bad meta-analyses, and there's re retracted.com, a site, um, I think it's .com, um, they, and th th these are researchers that are very, very important in our science and in our thinking. Um, so, and they should, they, uh, it, it's falsification, um, fabrication and plagiarism of, of, um, of science, and it, it, if it trickles into the clinical cold face, that's um, a big problem. So if you see a, a, a meta-analysis that you think is questionable, get to, to those links is the advice I would get you, and um, you, you'll get a, a richer bit of intel rather than from me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Carr. <coughs> the next speaker is Dr. Marcia. Marcia, sorry, Ryder, with a rich clinical background and now a researcher, a donor at the Ryder Science INC with a special interest in bioflow formation in vascular access devices. Thank Dr. Ryder, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, welcome to our session this afternoon. I find it quite interesting thus far. So I'm going to talk a little bit about RCTs and meta-analysis today with a little bit of a cautionary tale. And I have no disclosures for this particular session. So, several years in 2014, Dr. Pat Stone and her group at Columbia University took on a very ambitious uh, uh, program to evaluate the presence of evidence-based practice policies and clinician adherence to prevent healthcare-acquired infections in the United States intensive care units. So they all the hospitals in the NHSN process, uh, group were invited. So there were 1,534 ICU responses to this survey. And you see the items that they were questioned about. So the, in the first case, they ask, what is, do you have evidence-based practice policies in your units? And they did pretty well. As you can see, from 87% to 97% did have the, the correct policies in place. 
but then they ask and surveyed on the compliance of the policies, and we see a very different picture. And you can see only from 37% to about 71% were actually practicing those evidence-based practices. So there's a lot there to be desired. Then the next year, in 2015, they published another survey that was very similarly done. This time, they were looking at CLABSI rates in the United States PICUs and the current extents of the central line bundle compliance and the impact of that compliance on CLABSI rates. So they did a longitudinal cross-section survey, this time of the directors and managers of the infection prevention staff. How did they do? Well, they really didn't do much better than in the adult ICUs. And that's a very long list of numbers that you might not be able to see so well. But at the end of the day, although 73% of the PICUs had policies for central line practices, only 35% of those with policies reported a greater than or equal to 95% of compliance. And those that did have 95% of compliance did have lower CLABSI rates, but this was not statistically significant. Also draw your attention up there to that second section on optimal, the selection of the optimal catheter site, something that we've talked about a lot at this conference. And look at the numbers. Only 45% had a greater than 95% compliance. Look down the list of those 12% and 14% that either didn't know, they don't monitor, and they didn't even respond to the question. So... They don't know, they know what to do, but they don't do it. And so somebody has to do it. Well, who is that to be? Well, let's go to our guidelines and recommendations. And this is the 2011 CDC guideline that says to designate only trained personnel who demonstrate competence for the insertion and maintenance of peripheral and central catheters, category 1A. Then, in the background section, they go on to further explain that reports spanning the last four decades have consistently demonstrated that the risk for infection declines following the specialization of aseptic care. No surprise to any of us. And that insertion and maintenance of intravascular catheters by inexperienced staff may increase the risk for colonization. Specialized teams, very strong statement here, have shown unequivocal effectiveness in reducing the incidence of CRBSI and associated complications and costs. Move ahead to 2014, where the uh, SHEA uh, strategies to prevent central line infection. What do they comment about teams? Intravenous therapy teams for reducing CLABSI rates. Studies have shown that intravenous therapy team responsible for the insertion and maintenance of peripheral IVs reduces risk of BSI. However, few studies have been performed to regarding the impact of IV therapy teams on CLABSI rates. Hmm. Then, later in that document, they have a very nice section on implementation of strategies. And they're saying that, hey, somebody's got to be accountable for this. And as a matter of fact, it begins with the chief executive officers and other senior leaders who provide the imperative for HAI prevention. Then we move to the infusion nurses standards in 2016. And their uh, take on this is that we need to assign a vascular access device insertion or VAD management and surveillance only to trained individuals. Number one says that they should be accountable for inserting short peripheral catheters. And then they go on to say a designated team should be accountable for managing VADs. But over on letter D, they're talk they say consider having a team care for CVADs. I'm a little confused. I don't know about you. The other thing I'm a little confused about is the first one in terms of uh, the category one uh, for to assign an insertion team. And they have seven references there. 
and a category one by their evidence description is meta-analysis, systematic literature review, or at least three RCTs. I reviewed all seven of those papers and not one of them were an RCT or a systematic review or a meta-analysis. The rest of the recommendations here are on the lower end level of evidence. So, then in 2018, our distinguished colleague here on our panel and his group did a very fine job, outstanding job of presenting this evidence. And of course, Peter has all already addressed this and we know what this is about and gives a background about saying that there are numerous reports that suggest this is true. And the objective was, as he described, to look at RCTs to find the question. Are specialists better at this than uh, specialists? And they looked and searched for the analysis on randomized controlled trials. Well, as Peter alluded, they couldn't even do the analysis properly because they couldn't find any RCTs. So we don't have the evidence. Now I ask you, how does all of this serve the patient? Every one of us in this room knows that a specialized team will benefit and gives patient safety to our patients, but we don't have the evidence of that. So what? Well, if we want to do that, we are going to have to make a case for uh, multidisciplinary vascular access teams. What will it take to do this? And if our documents are saying that our senior and our administrative staff are responsible and accountable to do that, and you walk into the C-suite with a Cochrane review that says there is no evidence that this works. And I'm sorry, the reality of the situation is, at least in the US, at the end of the day, that decision will be all about money. And you know as well as I do that it takes a lot of money to build a vascular access team. It's a big cost center. And they're gonna take a hard look at that. And then also it goes down the trail for the responsibility of the clinical management team, the clinical staff, and again, the patient ends up at the bottom. Now, why do I say it's all about money? And what evidence do I have that that's true? Well, let's take a look. This is uh, uh, some of Naomi O'Grady's work, and this paper was published in 2016, and everybody got the notion, even at the top level in the country, that people were cheating because when uh, we began implementation of the penalties for the occurrence of uh, CLABSI, then people started to work around the system because it cost a lot of money. And so they looked at and evaluated, thinking that one way to track whether people might be cheating was a, how do you document a CLABSI? You have to have a positive blood culture, right? So we just won't do the blood cultures, and then we won't have any CLABSIs. Isn't that fun? And that's exactly what they did, because look at the conclusion. Following Medicare's institution of reimbursement penalties for CLABSI, there was a steady decrease in the frequency of blood culture orders in critically ill patients with CVCs in a cohort of U.S. Academic Medical Center. This observation supports the hypothesis that there may be less effort to detect CLABSI and warrants further investigation. Well, they did another little trick, unfortunately, in the U.S. to get around this. Hey, if the patient doesn't have a central line, they can't have a CLABSI. So there's been this massive move over to midline catheters and peripheral IV catheters. What has that done for? Because they don't have to report infections. So what happened? Well, we started seeing this. Midlines and peripheral IVs with high infection rates. I'm not saying that they weren't there before because I think they were there before. We just never looked. But now we see a lot of evidence of uh, very high rates of peripheral IV and midline infections. And most of the clinicians that are doing this have their blinders on. So this is um, a really critical issue in terms of what is the evidence doing for us? And this is not only, as you can see by these titles, a United States problem, it's a global problem. So in summary, 
then the bad news is that even though we have very um, well done evidence um, and reports, the patients that are receiving vascular access are at a significant risk for harm when we have evidence that we can't support a team for a patient. Now, I want to try to look to the good side and say the bad, the, the good news is that this is a very timely time, and we've talked about teams a lot almost in every presentation this week, to call for an action for evidence-based collaborative process for the establishment of multivascular access teams globally in the U.S., but we have to do it in a defined, comprehensive, and systematic way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryder. It seems that, uh, that we now run out of time, so uh, I will allow one question to Dr. Ryder, and let's see if you want to ask her in person after finishing the panel. Okay, so if there's no question now, thank you very much, Dr. Ryder. Uh, I will call the last speaker, Professor Claire Ricard, uh, who is currently professor at the University of Griffith, director of the Avatar, and uh, with special interest in making vascular access complication just history. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, just like to tell my children to get off the iPad so that they can see Mummy. Well done. <laughs> Uh, thanks, everyone. I'd like to thank Wokova for inviting me to speak in this session and also for giving me this topic. Um, I say that because before I was given this topic, I knew very little about this topic, but I have, uh, you know, had the opportunity to learn about it in the uh, preceding weeks. So could I ask those in the audience, who has written a guideline? Just hands up if you've been involved in a clinical practice guideline, quite a few people. Frederick, all, all of you are going to be crying by the end of this session, uh, as I was when I learned about what's expected now about including patients and consumers in the actual development of the guidelines. So um, a lot of speakers uh, in previous sessions and this have interpreted involving patients in guidelines or considering them as about offering them a choice of device, for example. But I'm going to speak actually about the process of developing the guideline before it even um, gets published. So here's my disclosures, which have absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Now, we have clinical practice guidelines clearly because we want them to benefit the patients. We want them to be used uh, and to achieve the best uh, practice care. But uh, there is a, a large body of evidence uh, saying that guidelines are often not implemented or not fully implemented. Uh, in fact, uh, one study I read, they uh, said that if guideline implementation for cancer was 100% uh, implemented, that they predicted 30% of cancer cases would be prevented altogether, 30% uh, would be uh, successfully treated, and 30% um, would be cured. Um, so uh, obviously that's not vascular access, but it's uh, interesting. Now, everyone here knows that I like a randomised controlled study, and I was thinking that this is a bit of a different topic for me, but guess what? I found a randomised study of writing a guideline with patients on your team or writing a guideline without patients. So amazingly, this was in dementia and uh, they wanted to write a guideline about diagnosis, diagnostic approaches for dementia. So they randomised the physicians to either be on the panel that included uh, carer and um, people with obviously not too, de too advanced dementia. <laughs> And, or to the panel uh, where there were no consumers involved at all, right? And so they all wrote a PICO statement, you know, um, the patient, uh, the intervention, the comparator, the outcome. They all searched the PubMed literature and condensed it and made guidelines. And then they compared and they found that um, not only did they come up with different guidelines, but um, also different outcomes, different um, processes of the guideline development. So it's quite a, an interesting um, thing to think about. 
so why should we? It's hard enough to write a guideline. We're doing it in our sort of home time, away from our kids. They get more iPad time, so mummy can write a guideline. And, um, you know, it's hard enough to write one, synthesise literature, um, work with a committee of lots of um, anaesthetists and infectious disease physicians and trying to get agreement. Um, so why make it even harder by then adding consumers and advocates who, of course, are not going to have the same world view that we have, who won't understand perhaps some of the science and stuff. Well, again, there is actually evidence um, where they have looked at whether guidelines are successfully implemented or how thoroughly they're implemented. And there is some evidence to say that if consumers were involved in the guideline development, that the implementability of the guideline is far higher and it's far more likely to be used and to be used comprehensively. So um, anyway, interesting, right? things I didn't know before before this. Now, if you are in the business of writing guidelines, honestly, these days you can't get away without doing um, evidence-based guidelines, you know, writing references with levels of evidence. Uh, but that's pretty new, you know, like it was only a few years ago in Queensland, where I'm from, that our state guidelines for intravenous therapy had not one reference not one, but now, you know, just in the last few years, they've been upgraded to have evidence and references. Uh, so similarly with these frameworks for how to write a guideline, before you write a guideline, you need to go and check these templates, these guidelines of how to write a guideline. So this one is from the Guidelines International Network and McMaster University, and it's a schema showing the stages. And over on your left-hand side with the bubbles, one of those bubbles is the, the consumers and the advocates. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily on your committee. It doesn't mean they're necessarily reading evidence, but they have to have some role and there has to be some part of the process that you go away and check with them, get their thoughts and um, check that what you think are the priorities are the same that they agree with. So here's the checklist uh, of how you involve consumers. Uh, you have to identify appropriate consumers. Obviously, in our area, it needs to be people who've had multiple devices, maybe a few different devices, um, and are also able to um, you know, express themselves verbally and participate and have time. But you do need to outline what you expect of them and how you will support them through this process. It's recommended usually to have at least two consumers on your panel or your committee because uh, if there's just one, they can feel a little bit isolated and overwhelmed. Uh, also, you want your guideline to not be criticised. And of course, these days we go through and we critique guidelines using this agree tool. These are all freely available on the internet. So um, we sometimes will do this, um, you know, at the university for a master's project, we will go through and critique various guidelines. And part, the part that the agree says about the um, consumers, I hope you can read it there because I'm struggling a bit. I'll report how you did ga gather their views and their preferences and how you then incorporated them into the document. So this should be published in the, in the final... Um, guideline. This is what NICE says, the UK guidelines. They say that every committee of NICE must have two consumers, by Tricia, uh, on their committee. So assuming that the new um, uh, Securicath uh, protocol for, that NHS has adopted would have had consumer involvement in it. World Health Organization, it, they're onto this as well. They're saying that all of the WHO guidelines have to um, have consumer involvement on them. Uh, this is a, the publication where they talk about why that is and that the consumers are not necessarily there to write the guideline. They're there to make sure that the assumptions and the values of the clinicians or the experts uh, are challenged. 
Um, a good example of this, not in vascular access, I'm sorry, but in knee osteoarthritis, there was a group who decided to look at the research priorities for knee osteoarthritis and they went and talked to the researchers and the clinicians and then the patients. The clinicians and the researchers said that the number one priority was pain management. But the consumers actually said that was not their number one priority. The number one priority was fatigue management. So, you know, that totally changed around the way that um, the research funding and the research direction was um, had. And who knows? We haven't asked vascular access patients. Um, so I don't think we know yet. So how are we doing? We have a lot of guidelines and some people here have written some guidelines and... If I read the report, the published one, would it actually say that you talk to one patient or one consumer or one parent or just a lot of your buddies? Well, the only one I could find that had anything written in it about a patient was Magic. And even um, Magic had one patient. So not two, but one. But at least it's there in their published report how they engaged with this patient and what their role was, what they did with them. So I hope that hasn't made all of you cry too much. It certainly made me think. And next time I get asked to be on a guideline committee, I'm going to have to try and think how we incorporate this. But I think it's all the more reason for not having 27 guidelines and actually just trying to have less guidelines, but do them together, do them properly, and also engage with consumers patients, advocates along the way. Thank you very much.